Great. Are there any questions before I jump into it? Oops, that's not where we are, is it? We are... Oh, don't do this to me. Um, where did I get to? I was here last time, wasn't I? Right. Okay. So, uh, here's another uh, way to look at this hierarchy of connective tissue. Uh, it's broken into connective tissue proper and then these specialized uh, connective tissues. Uh, within connective tissue proper, we're going to have loose and dense. Uh, and this is purely a histological uh, distinction when you look at them under a microscope. Uh, there's going to be some that are uh, densely configured and others that are not. Uh, and then within each of those, there are going to be three categories that we talk about. Within the specialized um, connective tissues, we're going to have two categories. There's going to be the fluid connective tissues, which uh, constitute the blood, and then the uh, supportive connective tissues divided between the bone and the cartilage. Right. We've already talked a little bit about uh, bone tissue in the, in the first unit. Um, e each of these different categories of connective tissue is uh, going to be populated by these nine types of connective tissue cells. Fibroblasts, fibrocytes, uh, which are obviously uh, connected to one another, developmentally connected. Adipocytes, mesenchymal cells, macrophages, lymphocytes, mast cells, microphages, and melanocytes. We're going to go through them one at a time, so don't worry. I'm not rushing this slide. First, uh, these two. Fibroblasts are the most common type of connective tissue cell in the body. Uh, they're in virtually every uh, type of connective tissue that you're, you're going to find. Um, and this is going, this cell type is uh, primarily responsible for producing fibrin, um, which is not the only, but is the bulk of the um, protein that uh, they're going to secrete. And then um, hyaluronic acid. And hyaluronic acid is a glycoprotein that um, hyaluronin is a glycoprotein made of uh, hyaluronic acid, which is an acidic carbohydrate, uh, an acid-bearing carbohydrate at, on the uh, C6 moiety of uh, the glucuronic acid. Um, fiber, yes? Go over the difference between proteoglycans and uh, glycoproteins and those. Okay, okay. Uh, a proteoglycan is going to be, and this is very quickly because I do not, do not want to get sidetracked too much here, but a proteoglycan is going to have uh, a, a protein core with large arborizations of uh, glycans, um, heteropolymeric uh, glycans sticking out from them. So the bulk of the uh, biomass in a proteoglycan is the glycan around a, a protein core. And a glycoprotein is a very generalized term that can be any kind of protein that has a carbohydrate on them, typically meaning some, you know, maybe globular protein or some sort of, uh, you know, whatever structural protein or something that has any kind of uh, uh, glycan on it so, and may not be, um, did I say heteropolymeric? I meant homopolymeric. And then uh, in, a proteo, in, in a glycoprotein, it can be a heteropolymer, so some sort of complex carbohydrate uh, that is appended to uh, a portion of it, but it's a much smaller uh, percentage of the molecular mass of, of that uh, complex. Yes, ma'am. Yes, that's right. No, 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 no. 
Good? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and fibroblasts can uh, mature into fibrocytes. Uh, they're also found in, in all uh, CT proper. Um, and they are responsible for repair, uh, maintaining uh, fibers and, uh, in connective tissue proper and uh, remodeling in connective tissue. All right. Adipocytes. These are for storage of fats. Uh, they are fat cells. When you look at uh, an adipocyte, you're going to see that they look kind of strange. Uh, it's these big, white, <coughs> vacuous spaces. In fact, they're not vacuums. They're full of lipids. <coughs> The nuclei and all the other cellular components are sort of squashed to the side. All right, they are low density um, and uh, very because of that they are very insulative. They have a low uh, they have a low heat capacity compared to other uh, cells in the body, and they act as excellent thermal barriers, uh, which is why um, your body chooses to put fat on the outside of rather than in the core. Um, mesenchymal cells. Uh, these are a stem cell that can mature into a variety of other cell types. Uh, these become stimulated when there is uh, some sort of assault, be that injury. Thank you very much. Um, Uh, whether there's injury or infection, um, this is where we get a number of the other uh, connective uh, cell types, uh, such as fibroblasts and then, uh, by extension, fibrocytes, macrophages, uh, microphages, etc. So the mesenchymal cells are, uh, are more primordial cells uh, in the connective um, tissue cell collection. Macrophages. These cells are so amazing. Uh, I have a picture there. They, they really are some sort of cell out of uh, a grade B uh, 1950s horror film. Um, giant. They are very large, as the name macro would lead you uh, to believe. Phage, uh, P H A. G E, um, yeah. What do you think, Logan? What is to eat? That's right. Yeah. Uh, so your esophagus is the true eating tube. Macrophage, the large eating cells. Um, their job is they're basically the garbage trucks of the body. Um, is there a pathogen? Well, surround it, uh, consume it break it down, send it to lysosomal uh, vacuoles, and, um, and proceed. Uh, perhaps there are uh, cancerous cells. Perhaps there are cells that have gone through apoptosis, cells that have been otherwise damaged and need to be taken out of the population. Um, this is the job of the macrophages. And so there are, the, all of these cells, um, are categories unto them unto themselves, right? And there are there are distinctions dependent upon the tissue that you can find them in. Um, macrophages can either be fixed, meaning they do not uh, roam, they do not roam about, they uh, kind of wait for things to come to them, they survey their immediate surroundings, or uh, they can be uh, f free to migrate, and that it can mean extravasation out of uh, the blood into tissue. They can uh, localize uh, where they're needed. Yes? Are macrophages able to utilize, like, deteriorating the pathogens as an energy source? Can they get ATP from that? Or do they just sort of destroy them and not really set up to digest them in that way? Mm -hmm. I cannot give you a firm answer on that. I'm sure... 
Uh, I could if I spent a moment looking at vesicular trafficking in uh, macrophages. My suspicion is um, that there may be some crosstalk between uh, glycolysis uh, and, and, and mitochondrial metabolism and uh, the vacuolar, vacuolar system in macrophages, but I don't, I don't know, actually, off, off the top of my head. I wouldn't be surprised. Okay. So, but that's a great question. Um, mast cells. So, mast cells are um, kind of like I, I, you know, I come from. I'm a different generation than than all of you, of course. And and when I was a child, my mother would take us uh, to, to Kmart, and there would be these like blue light specials. And they would take a shopping cart that had a big uh, post on it, and there would be a blue light on it, and they would turn it on, and that was like all the people would gather towards the blue light um, because it, it set off this warning. That's kind of like a mast cell. They are going to stimulate inflammation and draw other, uh, other cells from the immune system towards them. Uh, and they do this... Uh, cytotoxically through the action of histamine and heparin, um, both pro-inflammatory uh, compounds. Um, these same chemicals uh, are used by um, the number, a number of uh, the granular leukocytes, which we will talk about when we get uh, to the cardiovascular um, unit. Um, that they use uh, histamine and, and heparin as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about those, the action of those compounds at that point. This is just introducing you to some characters here. Um, lymphocytes. Uh, okay, so lymphocytes are a uh, subpopulation of uh, leukocytes in the, uh, in the blood. Um, so the cells produce antibodies. Uh, they can be T cells. They can be uh, B cells. Um, they are part of the adaptive immune system. That is the part of the immune system. So your immune system is broken up into uh, two general categories or perhaps phases is the right way to, to think about it. There is the innate or humoral uh, immune system where you are, um, we have, for example, like a natural killer cell uh, is going to be a cell that if it sees that you, uh, some cell, some pathogen is outside of what is normal, what, what belongs there, it just kills it. It just tries its best to, to kill it. Uh, whereas uh, lymphocytes in the adaptive immune system are going to use antigens to try to specifically target uh, cells. Yeah? I thought that like, it was only the B cells that make antibodies and the T cells use cytokines. No. no. Um, and so T cells and B cells themselves are both broad categories, and there's lots of different types of both of them. Absolutely, um, n neither of, both of them have the capacity to uh, to make antibodies, although not all of them have the capacity to make antibodies. Certainly, T cells uh, do, depending upon the T cell, they do have the capacity to produce different cytokines, uh, the interleukins, etc. But uh, all right, let's let's move on from here. We'll we'll get to talk about this more, a little bit more. This is not an immunology class. I'm not going to go deep into it, but you'll get some of it. Uh, microphages. Uh, phagocytic blood cells. Um, much like the macrophage, distinct, however, uh, in their size. They are activated uh, by either heparin or uh, histamine and uh, often can extravasate um, if, if need be uh, from the blood. So examples of these, these are the uh, granular leukocytes uh, that I spoke about earlier uh, when I talked about um, uh, 
heparin and, and histamine. So the three examples are eosinophils, neutrophils, or uh, polymorphonuclear leukocytes, and then the basophils. Uh, basophils are very rare. Uh, it's something like 0.5%, 0.05% of leukocytes are uh, basophils. Um, these neutrophils, the polymorphonuclear uh, leukocytes, they have these really oddly shaped uh, nuclei and uh, in a neutral uh, azurphilic uh, staining in their, uh, in their cytoplasm. And then eosinophils, uh, so-called because they are stained by eosin, which is a dye, it's a histological uh, distinction, um, and has this sort of horseshoe-shaped uh, nucleus. When you're looking at a blood smear uh, for any of these things, the first thing you want to do is note the relative size of the um, of the uh, leukocyte with respect to the red blood cell or the erythrocyte. Erythrocyte is about seven uh, micrometers, and um, the uh, Eosinophils are usually twice, uh, two and a half times that size. Neutrophils are a little less, about one and a half to two times the size. Um, basophils, if you're able to find one, the thing that's characteristic and distinctive about them is it's extremely hard to, to tell the difference between their cytoplasm and their nucleus. Uh, their uh, cytoplasm and nucleus uh, stain quite similarly, and you can see that the, they're called granular because there's this speckling uh, from the granules in the, the cytoplasm. So those are all uh, called microphages and get recruited to the site of inflammation uh, by the action of the mast cells uh, or uh, to some extent, the macrophages. Um, okay, so uh, melanocytes. These cells, uh, what we have over here, uh, produce melanin. And we'll talk about those a little bit when we get into the chapter about the skin. Um, and these also have this sort of amoeboid action where they stick out these long uh, tendril uh, pseudopodia that are able to penetrate uh, between epithelial cells. So we talked about the tight junctions that epithelial cells had that form this impermeable, impermeable barrier. Well, uh, melan melanocytes have the key to uh, get through those, those tight junctions, and they're able to uh, penetrate epithelial layers. Um, this characteristic of melanocytes is uh, what makes uh, melanoma so pernicious, their ability uh, to metastasize, their ability to uh, pass through what should be impermeable, otherwise impermeable uh, cellular layers is, is one of the reasons, one of the reasons why uh, melanoma is so deadly and needs to be, uh, you need to be vigilant against melanoma. Luckily, you can see it. It's on the surface. Um, melanin is a pigment that protects us from the deleterious effects of uh, UV, uh, portions of the UV spectrum that are not advantageous. We talked about the, what, 290 to 320 um, UVB window. Did I talk about that yet? Maybe I didn't. I did, didn't I? Yeah, I don't remember whether I talked about it or not in this class. But uh, it's that narrow band of UV radiation that um, your body needs. Oh, yeah, when we were talking about uh, synthesis of, of D3 from cholesterol. Um, so, But the other wavelengths of light can be quite damaging uh, to the DNA of, of unprotected cells. And it's this chromophore, this um, pigment melanin that helps to protect your body. We'll also find uh, this, this melanin, this pigment, 
uh, pigmented epithelium in the back of the retina. Uh, we'll talk about its use then. All right, so uh, in connective tissue, we can extrude different types of cellular products, uh, proteinaceous cellular products, uh, these connective tissue fibers. Uh, the first and probably the most important is collagen. Um, it's, it's straight, it is unbranched, and it's extremely strong. It's extremely strong along its uh, axis, all right? So it's basically like a hauser rope, like a, like a strong, thick uh, rope. Um, reticular fibers, on the other hand, are not as um, sturdy as collagen. However, they serve a different purpose. It's more like a web. They're more like a web, not quite a net. It's not sort of that regular pattern that you would find in a net. Uh, let's see if I have a nice picture of collagen. So there's certainly collagen here, uh, like this thing here. These would be collagen fibers. Can you see that? Uh, it looks like some collagen fiber maybe going this way. This is going to be uh, areolar tissue. This looks like areolar tissue. Uh, but it has the, the strong network of collagen. Uh, reticular fibers, we can see uh, they form this sort of web. And uh, reticular fibers uh, are going to be resist force in three dimensions. All right, So it doesn't have the absolute tensile strength of collagen, uh, but it uh, has just a, a, to a totally different... Um, I've used the word tensegrity before in the class, but a, a different spatial distribution of, uh, of support. All right? The reticular fibers are often used um, uh, to make uh, capsules. So, for example, the capsule of the um, kidney is almost entirely composed of reticular fibers. Um, yeah, so it's, it's spreading out across a two-dimensional plane to, to form that, but then also there's some depth to that uh, capsule, right? So the reticular fiber uh, resists force in 3D. And then uh, the elastic fibers. These are kind of like bungee cords, bungee cords, except uh, if bungee cords were a little bit branched. Not highly branched like reticular fibers, but a little bit branched every so often, um, yeah, so imagine a reticular fiber would be uh, something like if I gave one to Brandon, right? Is that your name back there? Yeah, and I gave one to Logan, and it came, and it would join here, and I had the other end. So the overall force vector is, you know, maybe here towards Haley or something like that, uh, but there is a little bit of branching. Um, it enables tissue to return to uh, its original shape after uh, expansion. So there's a lot of tissue in the body that needs to stretch and, and um, be able to return to its original shape, such as uh, there's a lot of uh, elastic fibers in um, the ligaments along, the transverse ligaments along the... Um, the vertebral column, for example, which allows your, your vertebral column to bend this way and that. Okay, so uh, here is just kind of a cartoon of uh, a, a non-existent connective tissue. Uh, if it looks like anything, it looks the most like uh, areolar tissue, all right? Um, although uh, areolar tissue doesn't have that much reticulum, uh, reticular fibers in it. But you see here... We have the different uh, we have the different cell types. Here's a fibroblast. Uh, what is that meant to be? Uh, I guess a mesenchymal cell. Uh, we've got different. You know, here here's uh, a lymphocyte. Uh, here's some adipocytes, etc. And then we have the extrusion of these uh, different proteins, the, the collagen, the uh, elastin, into uh, what is then called the matrix. Uh, the matrix is not here meant to be uh, something that Keanu Reeves uh, inhabits. Instead, it is the space between the cells, all right, that contains 
uh, two things. First, it contains the uh, proteins that are uh, secreted, extruded by these cells. And it also contains what is called ground substance. Ground substance. And this is a highly viscous, um, clear kind of jelly is maybe not quite the right word. Somewhere between jelly and honey, I guess, is the way I like to think about it. Um, it, it fills in the space uh, between connective tissue. Yes, Jacob, you're thinking deeply. Oh, uh, no. I see what was made of right below it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, glycosaminoglycans, proteoglycans, um, other adhesive glycoproteins. Right. So highly glycosylated uh, molecular structures. What would it be like if um, I filled a pool with jello and then told you to dive off the diving board into the jello and uh, and swim to the other side of, of that pool? Would that what would that be like? Quite a silly proposition. We can make it delicious by turning it into what tangerine lime lime jello. We're, we dove into some lime jello. Uh, what would that be like? It would be much harder than if it were water. Easy answer, right? Uh, so why is it advantageous for uh, connective tissue to have this highly viscous substrate, this, this ground substance? Yeah, Logan, what do you think? It's something to do with like, osmotic pressure and it was just water and then like, solute and stuff would move around too easily? Absolutely, absolutely. There is elements uh, of keeping an isotonic balance between uh, the, the fluid compartments, the in intracellular and the extracellular fluid compartments. But if that were the case, could we not just do that with uh, simple solutes? Why are we using all of these, these sugar-containing uh, compounds? And, and I would ask you to think differently about sugar than the six teaspoons that you put over your uh, cornflakes in the morning. Yeah. Hydrogen bond? Nobody does that, do they? It's, it's, it's very uh, cohesive because it hydrogen bonds to itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so how do, they, how do you make, how do they make jello, actually? What is jello? It's pectin, isn't it? No, it's jelly. Jelly is pectin. But pectin I it's, works. I think it's actually collagen. I think it's. Yeah, I think that might be right. They used to make it out of horse hooves. Uh, anyways, the, the point that I'm trying to make here, and that he is uh, kind of helping me with, is that carbohydrates, let's break the name down, carbohydrate, they are hydrated, it's hydrated carbon, right? The empirical formula of a carbohydrate is CH2O sub N, right? And that's how long the carbon chain is. Each of those carbons carries a hydroxyl group. A hydroxyl group or an alcohol group uh, loves to hydrogen bond to water. Sugars resist dehydration. They resist dehydration. Okay? And moreover, they radically change the bulk solvent properties that um, they radically change the bulk solvent properties. Uh, in which they're found. So, uh, for example, um, that's why pectin uh, gels up the way it does. It takes that water and those carbohydrates tightly hold that water to them. Uh, slugs. Anybody play with slugs? My daughter loves them. Right? Um, so you pick up a slug and, wow, this thing's crazy and weird, and you play with it for a half hour, and then you go feed it to the chickens, and, my God, your hands are coated in this yellow slime that you go to the sink, and you can't even wash off, right? It's hard to wash off. There is some sort of mucin in there, some carbohydrate-containing uh, glycoprotein that is um, not, that, that resists being washed off. All right, that holds water. 
Same thing here. We have these glycosaminoglycans, the GAGs, the different proteoglycans, <coughs> adhesive uh, glycoproteins that are resisting A, resisting dehydration, B, uh, making it much more viscous, making it much more viscous, and in so doing, preventing the, the um, transport, the motion of any pathogen that may penetrate uh, to this collagen or uh, to this connective tissue layer. So this you know, areolar tissue is laying in the papillary layer of the skin, for example. It's what makes your skin able to do this. Uh, and you get a cut, pathogen gets in there, gets into this areolar tissue, and it's like, oh, my God, just let me get to the light. I know it's there somewhere. It's moving, but it can't, it can't get away fast enough before, where's my macrophage? Uh, here's one, I guess. That's supposed to be a macrophage. Uh, the macrophage catches up and says, not, too, not so fast, buddy. Lights out. All right. So uh, the viscosity of the ground substance is, uh, serves numerous purposes. Uh, one of them certainly is uh, defense against pathogens. And I guess I say that down there at the bottom. So, yeah. Is the ground substance? Well, I was asking. I'm sorry. Logan. Um, how do the free macrophages move around so well? Mm -hmm. I would love to get into uh, a longer discussion of that. Um, I will say, I will, I will perhaps whet your appetite by saying this, that uh, DNA uh, encodes information in a very linear fashion, right? ATGC, etc. cetera. Um, proteins encode their information not just in the linear sequence that is a reflection of DNA in the genetic paradigm, but they have a three-dimensional structural configuration which has informational content. Uh, th their structure is related to their function uh, in a three-dimensional sense. Okay, Carbohydrates and, and those are both intrinsic information encoding, like intrinsic to the structure, right? Carbohydrates, uh, carbohydrate chemistry lags the understanding uh, in some of the other fields uh, because the information encoding in carbohydrates is often extrinsic, extrinsic, meaning that you put a carbohydrate in to, uh, let's we'll talk a monosaccharide. You put glucose into bulk water, and it is part of its information content is in how it uniquely disturbs or perturbs the bulk water structure, the structure of the bulk water. There is an ensemble, an average structure to uh, the the connectivity and the behavior of bulk solvent at a certain temperature, right? That perturbation is time dependent as well. So, so carbohydrates are by far the most uh, conformationally flexible of all of the, um, the biomolecules. These hy hydroxyl groups are constantly reorienting and in so doing uh, they have, there's a unique perturbation profile to the solvation sphere around a carbohydrate. Now, consider for a moment that uh, if you have a uh, tetranucleotide uh, with the four options, there's going to be 256 possible tetranucleotides. If you have, with the 20 amino acids, there's going to be like 16,000 tetrapeptides. Uh, if you only consider biologically relevant carbohydrates with linear linkages, not branched linkages, with both anomeric configurations and all the possible linkages that are found uh, biologically, you have approximately 17 million possible tetrasaccharides. If you allow branching, it is on the order of 10 to the 23rd possible 
tetrasaccharides. So there is this enormous, enormous library of structural poss possible structural diversity. All of those linkages, those, car those saccharide glycosidic linkages, are conformationally flexible and move around. Adding this unbelievable layer of informational complexity to the way that a solvation sphere is uniquely perturbed by any one glycan or another. All right, and this is, and, and this is the selective pressure that guides the uh, the glycome, the distribution of of glycans uh, that decorate all these glycoproteins and whatever. Right, so. The, the point that I'm trying to make about macrophages here is when you have some sort of glycan that is controlling the solvation sphere around some structure, around some interfacial boundary at a cell or wherever, right? When you have the carbohydrate that's ma managing that solvation sphere, certain binding partners are able to come together more readily than other solutes because a ligand may have preferential access uh, because of its unique solvation characteristics to the solvation sphere of its binding partner. Macrophages, macrophages uh, have a number of evolutionary characteristics that enable them to preferentially penetrate solvation spheres in this ground substance that enable them to move uh, with relative impunity through uh, the, this substrate, okay? Does that, it's like, it's an ocean that we could talk about there. It's fascinating uh, stuff, but that, that is, that's all I'm going to say about it. Does that answer your question, sort of? All right, uh, glycosaminoglycans. So, um, gags are these structures where you have a protein core. You're going to have a protein core, a linear protein core, that uh, is decorated with these uh, homopolysaccharides. So, these uh, repeating units that uh, branch out from that that core. And uh, there's two uh, common ones here that, uh, that I'm showing are uh, high aluronic acid and uh, chondroitin sulfate. And there's others. There's, I, I got a picture of keratin sulfate down there. Um, so the thing that I'll have you notice about them uh, is that all of these, here's chondroitin sulfate. So uh, here's glucuronic acid, there's carbon-6. It's, it's been oxidized to form a carboxylic acid. Uh, here's uh, galactose, N-acetylgalactosamine, uh, uh, or GALNAC, but it's been sulfated at that, uh, that hydroxymethyl group at C6. So this chondroitin sulfate is strongly anionic. There's a strong anionic charge on uh, this chondroitin sulfate here. Uh, it, these are both acids, and, uh, and we have the conjugate base here, which is going to give us um, a lot of negative charge on, on this. And then we also see the same in keratin sulfate, and uh, to a le lesser extent here on high aluronic acid, high aluronate, or the conjugate base. So we have this uh, glucuronic acid, or the, 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 um, uh, the, the urinate here, uh, the, the ionized form, and then the, and then the glucnac. Um, so there's an N-acetyl uh, glucosamine, uh, N-acetyl group uh, down there. All of that uh, negative, either explicitly or implicitly negative, uh, negative, charge density on these molecules are going to act uh, as, they're going to specifically perturb uh, the uh, solvent environment in a unique uh, way that's going to give rise to the biophysical properties in the ground substance that we're looking for, kind of getting towards what we were talking about a moment ago. Um, so you're going to find chondroitin 
uh, in, in your blood vessels and bone. Um, it's also what uh, gives rise to the uh, stiffness of, of cartilage. Uh, high hyaluronic acid, uh, it's a little bit more uh, slippery and viscous, uh, and we use this as a joint lubricant. So the thing about, and it's also in the vitreous body of the eyeball, having all this negative charge uh, density is going to repel itself, right? It's going to repel itself. So it's going to make it very slick, right? It's kind of like, um, like maglev, if you think about that. You have, uh, op, you know, charges that uh, you have negative charge and negative charge, they're going to repel each other, and so it's, you know, the, the maglev can float over the negative charge. It's the same thing here with uh, the hyaluronic acid. You have all this negative charge density, so two layers of negative charge density is going to allow it to be a very slippery uh, substance, but also viscous, viscous but uh, slippery, unique properties. All right, so this is, this is one of the cellular products that you'll find in the ground substance. Now, we're going to begin to go uh, specifically through a couple of um, the... I don't want to get too hung up here. I kind of got sidetracked. Um, I'm going to flash through these because this is really more anatomy than physiology. Um, dense CT is uh, essentially a tendon. Uh, it, um, so dense regular connective tissue. The names are very descriptive of what you have. Uh, it's dense, tightly packed, regular, meaning that it uh, is all heading in the same direction. Um, and this, this is essentially tendons. Uh, then there's dense irregular connective tissue. This is going to be uh, the dermis. Uh, below. So we have epidermis, and then the papillary layer of the dermis, which is, uh, we'll talk about this on Monday, is the uh, areolar tissue. And then below this is dense irregular tissue. This has, uh, definitely has reticular fibers uh, in it, but uh, it's not regularly disposed. <clears throat> this, this connective tissue is uh, resisting uh, stress in three dimensions. Irregular, uh, irregularly uh, arrayed. And then finally, elastic tissue, um, dense bundles of elastin. Oh, so this is one of the examples I use, the transverse uh, ligament um, in the vertebral column, but there's, they're all over the place. Uh, so for example, um, well, you, you can see a few up there. I don't want to get too bogged down in this. Uh, areolar tissue is quite important, however. Uh, so this is the loose connective tissue. Um, areolar tissue is in the papillary layer of the dermis. It's very loosely uh, organized. It has, uh, it's very stretchy. So it, it's given its name, I believe, uh, because does anyone have um, any younger brothers or sisters where they watch their, their mother or whoever uh, breastfeed? So a uh, uh, lactating woman, there, the areola is some stretchy stuff, uh, and it's highly enriched in uh, high density of areolar or connective tissue. Uh, but areolar or connective tissue is actually across your whole body um, in, in the papillary layer, and you find it in other places in the body as well. Um, yeah. Reticular tissue, I've talked about this. This uh, often forms uh, the capsule or stroma um, is uh, in the lymphatic uh, organ. So the, like, the actual body of the lymphatic tissue is uh, made up of this reticular tissue, uh, highly um, expressed reticular fibers. Um, adipose tissue. Okay, so this is actually interesting. Uh, white fat versus brown fat. So white fat is what most of us uh, in here, I'm, in, at this point all of us, uh, have pretty much exclusively white fat in their body. Um, this is, it has all the functions we've already uh, covered. Uh, it absorbs shock, slows heat loss, etc. However, in babies, uh, like my daughter here, uh, there's, there's brown fat. 
and uh, brown fat, all this, this cute chub in there, um, that is uh, brown because it's highly enriched in uh, mitochondria, all right, and it's highly vascularized. Um, this is, has anybody babysitted a little baby and then watched them grow up in high school at all? Yeah. So you've probably seen that part where the baby goes from this little butterball uh, that's kicking its legs in the air and, and gurgling cutely, and then suddenly it learns how to pull itself up, and next thing you know, it's walking around. And boom, that cute chubby chubbiness sort of melts off of its body and gets turned right away into uh, muscle, right? And, and their, their, their percent body fat shifts very quickly at that point. Uh, this is brown fat, right? The, the envy of, of everyone who watches uh, Dr. Oz or something like that. Um, it's brown because of the mitochondria and the blood. So what? Finish my thought process. What? Why? Why is the brown fat like that? Why does it have more mitochondria? Why is it more vascularized? I've already told you what happens to brown fat. So connect, connect the dots. They're right next to each other. What do you think? Somebody, I talk all the time. Give me someone else. Yeah, Matt. Uh, it kind of acts as a stepping stone to make it easier to transition to muscle than just from white fat. Yeah, it's because it's highly vascularized, uh, because it has this high density of mitochondria, it's able to rapidly metabolize all that fat, and you can access those uh, energy stores very quickly. Um, so... All right, I want to keep going. We've talked about bone already, um, but here's an important point I didn't make. So we have cartilage, uh, and it has this, this uh, highly um, gelatinous ground substance, um, and then bone. A point that I want to make, you've heard the term, oh, wow, uh, I'm dry as a bone right now, or whatever. You, you've heard that, that term, right, or my, my socks have... Dried out. They're dry as a bone. Um, that is incorrect, actually. That's not a very good characterization of bones. Um, bones are, in fact, highly vascularized. They're entirely permeated with blood vessels uh, down through this haversion system. I don't remember if I talked about the haversion system in class, but uh, there's these canals that go through all these osteons, and here's the osteocytes with the canaliculi and the tiny little capillaries running through them. Bone tissue is richly supplied with blood. Cartilage is avascular. Cartilage is avascular. There is no blood supply to your cartilage. So nutrients get into cartilage by diffusion. What's the upshot of this? If I were to, I'm, I'm playing rugby, okay? Yeah. Well, if you're for shock absorption, you wouldn't want blood vessels in them because if you're hit hard, you can break the blood vessels. Okay. Uh, you can heal bone more easily than you can heal cartilage. Bingo. You were heading there, but that's it. Exactly. So. Um, you can get all the nutrients to help repair an injury. Uh, cartilage, it's much more difficult. Soft tissue damage is, uh, is much more pernicious in the long term than bone injury, breaking a bone. Um, this is why I don't, I, I'm out of time, unfortunately. I'm used to these longer lectures. i got to get used to 50 minutes. But uh, this is why um, doing, you know, Passive stretching, gentle compression, and expansion and extension of uh, the soft tissues is so good for you in terms of the long-term health. Uh, cartilage has all these uh, lacuna in here. You compress it, uh, and you do that all the time, moving around. It's pressing fluids out of the tissue, but also you need to be able to expand or stretch uh, the cartilage, uh, almost like a sponge, allowing the fluids uh, to diffuse into uh, the tissue. That, that's ex extremely important for the long-term uh, health of cartilage. Okay, I'm, I'm done. I didn't get as far as I wanted to get today.
But um, Monday, I'll clean up uh, connective tissue uh, just for hopefully not more than 10 minutes. And then I'll talk about integument, the skin. Are there any questions? Get some sleep. Have some fun. Make sure to do at least five things that make you laugh this weekend. That's your homework. Five things that make you laugh. On Monday, you got to come and tell me one thing to make me laugh. Okay? Is that a dumb high school assignment? <laughs> I don't know. Kind of dumb? I don't know. It's...